I read a story this week about a boy who woke up in the middle of the night and smelled smoke. It was California, 2003. Mom and Dad got up and sort of investigated the house and everything seemed fine inside. In the door, they... The street had already filled up with... The air was filled with smoke and then when they looked up into the hills, they realized that everything was on fire. Later they realized that they were in the midst of what came to be known as the worst wildfire in the history of the state of California. Interestingly enough, I learned some things about wildfires that I don't think I would ever knew before. The wildfires, wildfires, Larry, could get up to temperatures of over 2 thousand degrees could melt even metal and that wildfires sometimes can travel as fast as 60 miles per hour so there wasn't a lot of warning as it began to evacuate the town some made it most made it many made it but some did not horrifying stories from this wildfire and other wildfires that Rack that part of the country and other parts of the country seemingly every year, sometimes worse than others. There are places in the country, even at this very moment, I believe in Oregon and other places that are battling wildfires even as we speak. One horrifying story that I read about, about a family trying to get away. They were surrounded, they could not get away, and so they sought shelter in their swimming pool. They did survive, however, it was a terrifying experience as they were surrounded by fire on, in every direction. They were just feet away from watching their house disintegrate into ashes, fearing that they might either burn to death or boil to death in the pool. The heat was getting so hot. As I said, the wildfires could spread with very little notice. There's not a lot of warning, at least here on the Mississippi Gulf Coast with a hurricane coming. At least we have a little bit of warning. But here we are in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. And the Apostle Peter is sounding an alarm. He's saying there is a dire devastation that is coming. And we need to sound the alarm. Now for those of us who are believers, who are Christians, who have been saved by the finished work of Christ on the cross, we know that we are safe from this day of destruction that Peter is reminding us of. However, I'm going to ask us to save that rejoicing for another day. Because not everyone can rejoice. There are those, even though the sound is going out of the alarm, they are turning a deaf ear to this warning that Peter has for us in the pages of Scripture this morning. Let's look at it closely this morning. I want to do as we typically do, sort of pick it apart and suck as much meaning out of the text as we have this morning. And so as we have turned this morning to Second Peter Chapter 3, verse 10. I want you to hear what Peter says. He begins by saying, But the day of the Lord will come. The day of the Lord will come. Now, of course, that begs the question, what does Peter mean by the day of the Lord? Now, his original hearers would have been very familiar with this terminology of the day of the Lord. And if you're familiar with Scripture, you ought to be familiar with this terminology, the day of the Lord. It, is, it comes up quite often in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament. I'm not going to take the time to sort of trace out all of those references and click on all of those links and, and look at all the things that the Bible says about the day of the Lord. 
There's a, a lot that, it, that, are, that is said that would take us a while, and, and to be quite honest, it gets a little monotonous at times, and if you look at it real closely, it gets a little bit confusing. Now, the big picture is very clear, and that, that's where I want to focus on this morning, very clear, but I have to mention, to be quite honest with you, that if you look at all the details, it gets a, a little bit confusing, and you have to kind of untangle the knots because... I'll just briefly mention a couple of those difficulties that you have to kind of spend some time untangling because if you look into the Old Testament, many times in the prophets, when they're talking about the coming day of the Lord, you wonder, what is the day of the Lord? They were talking in their day about a coming day of destruction that culminated in 586 B.C. when Jerusalem fell. You're probably familiar with the story from the Old Testament. If not, it was when Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, sacked the city of Jerusalem, the capital city of Israel that was uh, surrounded by a gigantic defensive wall and and inside the city was that great magnificent temple there that Solomon, King Solomon had built and they figured they were God's people and they were safe from any destruction, and while the prophets like Jeremiah and others warned of a coming day of destruction because the people of God had turned their backs on God, he warned them of that day, and they said, oh no, oh no, not here, not us. We are safe. The temple of God, the temple of God, the temple of God is here. We are okay. And they went along in their lives doing their own thing, basically snubbing their nose at the law of God. And God used an evil king to rain down destruction on his own people. And again, there is times in the New Testament, namely in Jesus' own words, where he looked forward to a day in, in, in dread, in dreadful warning of promise there in Matthew 24, speaking of the destruction of Jerusalem once again, the final destruction of God's covenant people there under the Old Testament in A.D. 70 when the Romans came and destroyed the city and the temple and put the sacrifices to end once and for all. Jesus referred to that in Matthew 24. And here in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, it's quite possible that Peter is somewhat alluding to that coming destruction in our past, but in, in Peter's future to A.D. 70, but it's more likely that he is ultimately referring to the final day of the Lord that is still in all of our futures when all the debts will be paid and all uh, things will be made right and all reckoning will be meted out by a holy and just God and the Apostle Peter wants us to hear his warning and so he says the day of the Lord will come do you hear the surety of his he's not saying it might come I'm pretty sure the day of the Lord is going to come I I, I think that the day of the Lord is going to come the day of the Lord will probably come no he says the day of the Lord will come Notice, notice in your text, if you're reading for the ESV especially, there's a but there. Of course, that conjunction ties to what we've been talking about for the past few weeks. I won't, uh, won't reiterate all of that, but you'll remember if you've been here, you can read up in the, the previous sections of 2 Peter um, chapter 3 and, and even back into chapter 2 where there were many false teachers and scoffers who were thinking the day of the Lord would not come. He hadn't come yet. He, he's been delayed all this time, and they're really questioning whether or not their actions and their attitudes and their disposition and the things that they were doing was ever going to bring the judgment of God. And they were snubbing their nose like the Old Testament false prophets were doing, snubbing their nose at the prediction of believers saying, Judgment Day is coming. And so Peter here reiterates and says finally in verse 10 here with a thud. And I want you to hear that thud there in verse 10 where he says, the day of the Lord will come. It's 
there's an emphasis here in the text that I, I don't want you to miss. And, and I, y'all, y'all know I sometimes hesitate to bring up the original language that the Apostle Peter is speaking in or writing in because as soon as I start to mention the Greek, some of y'all turn off. So don't, don't turn me off. This is something that's very simple to understand. In English, we, in our day, we have different ways of emphasizing something when we're writing it down, right? And so if you're writing something down and there's, you write a sentence and you want to emphasize one particular word or a couple of words, you might, if you're typing it, you might put it in bold, you know, highlight it and hit that B on your word processor, right? Or, if you're, or, 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 or maybe you do, do it in italics or, or maybe underline it. If you're handwriting, maybe you underline it or circle it or put a little stars around it. You might do something like that to emphasize it. But in Greek, in Peter's day, when they were writing in Greek, the way that they did that was actually in the word order of their sentences. And so if they really wanted to emphasize something, they would change the word order. And so here, and the reason that's important here is in this sentence, here in verse 10, he puts the verb, will come, first in the sentence to emphasize the certainty of the coming of the day of the Lord. And so if we translate it, literally it would come out in English a little awkward. Will come the day of the Lord. You, you see, so it's kind of a little awkward in English. But in Greek, it is the way that they, in, they would emphasize. It was kind of his way of putting an underline under it and typing it in bold and put a little asterisk around it and point, maybe arrows pointing to it. Look, this is something that is certain. There's a surety, a certainness of this coming day of the Lord. It is sure. It is certain. It will come. And so he says, but the day of the Lord will come. He says it will come like a thief. It will come like a thief. And so he modifies this coming and says he's going to come like a thief. Now in what way is the day of the Lord, this final day of judgment that is coming down, that he's going to elaborate on the qualities and characteristics and attributes of it in just uh, just a second. In what way is it like a thief? Well, I think that it's very simple for us to do because we can click on that and there's two other places that this same exact terminology is used in the New Testament. Once by Jesus himself and once by the Apostle Paul. And since these three guys hung around together uh, and they're talking about the same topic, Peter and Paul and Jesus. Well, Paul came a little bit later, but he's learning from Jesus and from Peter. They're using this terminology to speak of this final day in a similar way. What they're referring to in Matthew 24, we'll start there. You don't have to turn to it. You can look it up uh, later. But what Jesus is referring to is the sort of the unexpected nature of a thief. The unexpected nature of a thief. And Jesus actually even elaborates. Here Peter just alludes to it, just says it very quickly, like a thief. But Peter says, uh, but Jesus elaborates more and he says, look, if you have a house, and there's a guy that has a house, if he knows when, at what, time, what day, and what time of night a thief is going to come, he's going to be ready for him. You, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so, so like if, if you knew that somebody was planning on robbing your house, on a particular night, in the middle of the night, I have a feeling, I know most of y'all, uh, y'all, y'all would be awake and ready with a, with a housewarming gift for the guy, if you know what I mean, right? Uh, you, you'd be ready for him. And Jesus says, look, look, if you knew what time, you'd be ready for him. But the problem is, many in our day do not realize that there's an unexpected visitor coming. There's an unexpected visitor coming, and they're oblivious to it. And, Paul, and Jesus is warning, and the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians says the same exact thing. He said, now Jesus says, you should not. He turns to his disciples and says, you shouldn't be taken unaware. He says, I'm warning you. You know. Y- y'all are in the know. And so we, we may not know when this day of the Lord is exactly coming. We don't know what day of the calendar it's going to be on. We don't know if it's going to be next week, next month, next year, a thousand years from now, ten thousand years from now. We don't know when it's going to be, but we do know this thing, it is coming. And so Jesus says, you have been warned, you know, you're in the know, but the tragedy is that there are many who do not know. And they're going to be taken unaware. 
They don't realize, and they're going along their merry way and thinking that everything is fine and dandy, and they are crying out the, 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 uh, 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 a mirror, the, an echo of what the Old Testament uh, people were saying, the, the, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Everything is fine. We have peace. We have prosperity. Everything is good. God hasn't punished us yet. We're living our life. We're having parades. We're doing our thing. God doesn't seem to mind. He's up in heaven or wherever he might be. He doesn't take any mind of us. We can just keep doing what we're doing and we will be good. Peter says, the day of the Lord is coming like a thief. You don't know what hour, you don't know when, but I can guarantee you one thing, he is coming. One of the Old Testament prophets said, said it like this. He said, he said it's kind of like the guy who is out in, in the city streets and there's a lion chasing him. And so he knows there's danger. There's a lion. And he runs from the lion, he comes in his house and he closes the door and he locks the door and now he thinks he's safe. I'm fine, I'm in my own house. The lion's out there, I'm in here, I have a good door, I have good walls, I have good windows, I'm protected, there is no, nothing that can touch me, I am home, I am safe, I am secure. And about that time, a snake bites him, and he dies. He says, that's, that's what many are like. They think they're fine. They think they've escaped danger they've heard the warnings they've heard the 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 the, uh, the, the uh, tornado warnings they've heard the 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 warnings coming in over the radio and they've heard the emergency management uh, announcements and they think that they are safe yet Peter says the day of the Lord is coming and it's coming like a thief there's a certainty to it and there'll be a suddenness to it and it's going to take them by surprise. Peter's warning us, though, it shouldn't be taking us by surprise, but it will take many by surprise. Let's continue to look at what he says about this coming day of the Lord. Not only is it like a thief, that's the first thing that, that he says, but then secondly, he says, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar. The heavens will pass away with a roar. Now, when I say that word roar there, you might immediately think of lions, especially since I just mentioned a lion just a moment ago. I don't think he's talking about a lion. I think he's, 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 he's going to be talking about using the uh, imagery of fire here in a minute. And so he's talking about the raging of a fire, the noise of a fire. Now, like I said, I've never been in a wildfire. I have to talk to my uh, friend uh, Randy McCarver. Some of y'all uh, know uh, Randy. Uh, Randy was a firefighter in California. Uh, that's what he did for a living, a fire chief there, and fought some of those uh, massive wildfires there. And now he's retired, lives on the Gulf Coast, and lives over in Diamond Edge. Uh, but he can tell you a horrifying stories about fighting those kinds of fires. And they say that when... A wildfire is raging, it's louder than a freight train. And I guess I can, I can understand that. It, I mean, we can build just a small little bonfire, you know, you can, you know, it, when it gets roaring, you know, you hear it, the, the noise of it. Uh, I, I remember one time, I'll tell you a little funny story. Is, um, uh, uh, is, this is just a few years ago. We had a group of um, uh, volunteers here, a mission team uh, here. They were staying at the bunkhouse uh, across the way here on the other side of our property. And there was a bunch of debris or something that they, they had piled up. We had piled up. It was a pretty big pile, but it was only about, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 feet, maybe, well, maybe 15, 20 feet from the bunkhouse. And so it was a little close to the bunkhouse, a little closer than I was comfortable with. I wanted it to be moved some, but they wanted to light it on fire. They wanted to have a little bonfire and everything. And so they said, Brother Don, can we light this on fire? I said, on one condition, you all have to stay out here and watch it. It's pretty close to the building. You need to keep an eye on it. You know, make sure that it's okay, it's under control. Oh, yeah, no problem. We'll, we'll take care of it. Some college students, you know, some college guys, they were, they were, they were going to watch this fire. I said, okay, if y'all promise you got to watch it, it's too close to the building for my comfort, but if y'all are out here, you got a, a hose sitting here, and everything set up, so they said, no problem, no problem. And so they said, okay. Then I had a couple other things I needed to do. I think over at the Mercy House, there were some other people uh, uh, bringing in something or doing something over there. So I went over to the Mercy House and was there for a, few, a couple of hours or so, and then I decided to come back and check on the guys at the fire. Well, I got about halfway across the parking lot, and I could hear this bonfire just ripping. 
I mean, you know, you could hear it from maybe 200 feet away. You could hear it just roaring. And I got around the side of the office and I got back there and there was flames shooting up from this bonfire taller than the building, taller than the bunkhouse, maybe 25 feet high and not a soul around. <laughs> no one was there. I'm like, what in the world? And so I sat there, watched the fire, had the hose with me and everything. And it finally, after a couple of hours, died down. And here the guys come around the corner driving up in their, in their vehicle. They had went to the beach. They said, oh, you got it started? I'm like, no, I didn't get it started. <laughs> they said, I said, y'all started it. They said, oh, no, we tried and tried. It never got started. I'm like, oh, yes, it did. <laughs> they had walked off. But I tell you all that story. I guess I told you that whole story just so that I could say from 200 feet away I could hear that bonfire roaring. So, and it was just a relatively small bonfire. Can you imagine a, a wildfire in California or in some other part of the country that's, that's consuming, that we see on TV here for hundreds of acres of land on fire with a fire running through the, the, the landscape at 60 miles an hour? I can't even imagine what that sound would be like. But that's nothing in comparison to what Peter is painting a picture of here in our text this morning when he says the entire heavens are ablaze and the entire universe is on fire and there is a mighty deafening roar he is wanting us to have terror in our hearts as we hear him using the strongest language possible to speak of this dreadful day of the lord that is coming that is sure to come you, you get what i'm trying to say He's wanting us to hear the gravity, the seriousness. The, 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 uh, it, it is a scary sight. The heavens are passing away and there is a mighty noise. A great of fire. He says, that's not all. And then he goes on and he says, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. The heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. Your translation may say the elements instead of heavenly bodies, which is a very interesting, interesting word here, word choice that Peter uses. And, and it's interesting that the different translations, some say elements and some say heavenly bodies. Let me explain what I, what I mean there. I remember, actually, I remember uh, reading this uh, passage or hearing this passage preached as a young boy. And, and as, as I mentioned uh, many times, I... I as a kid, I loved science. I, I loved history as well. I was one of those. I just loved every every subject, but especially science. Uh, and it was so interesting. And I was in class learning about you know elements and the periodic table and all of that. And and so when the preacher started preaching Second Peter chapter three about the elements being dissolved under this intense heat, and started talking about the melting point of aluminum and sulfur and various elements. I mean that was intriguing to me. However, I hate to tell that, that pastor, that I, preacher that I had 30, 40 years ago that this word elements is not the periodic table. That's not really what Peter is getting at uh, here. However, I don't, I don't want to push back on that too far because the, the big picture idea is, is the same. What, what Peter, the word that Peter's using here refers to basically, I, I would say, the building blocks of the universe. What the, what the universe is made of is, is the word that, he's being, that is used there. And so, in, in depending on what circles that you're looking at and looking at some extra biblical literature, sometimes they would use this word to refer to like the sun, the moon, the stars, you know, the building blocks of the universe, everything that exists, the earth, everything that exists. That's the elements. Or, or so th that's why that's why the ESV translates it as heavenly bodies: the sun, the moon, the stars. Or in other uh, ancient. Eastern literature, the same word could refer to the elements of uh, water and fire and, and wind, and, you know, those kinds of, of things. Uh, and so whatever the case, whatever Peter's exact meaning of this particular word, I think the general thrust, thrust is very easy to understand. What he is saying is everything that can be burned is going to burn. Everything that can melt is going to melt. Everything that can be dissolved is going to be dissolved. This is not just a little grease fire on the stove. I'm talking about something with cosmic ramifications. 
I'm, I'm talking about something that is going to shake the universe to its core. When the final day of the Lord comes and the judgment of Almighty God is poured out, it is going to shake the very existence of the universe to its very foundation. Do you see what he's saying? And so Peter is using the strongest language possible. But not only that, he it continues to go on in the text after he says that the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. He says, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Will be exposed. Again, depending on your translation, may say, will be burned. Now, that might seem like two different, when I say that, that depending on your translation, will be burned up or will be exposed, you might think that that's two different ideas there. It's really not, if you think about what Peter is saying. It, 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 I guess probably one of the best ways to under, understand this is, when you, you, ever, you ever clear any land by, by burning it? <laughs> you know, set it on fire? You know, maybe it's all overgrown, you have a piece of land. I know some of y'all have done that. Uh, for sure, I know some of y'all have done that. Uh, you, you have a piece of land, it's all overgrown, maybe it says brush on it and everything. And the easiest way to do it is just mow all the way around it and set it on fire and it will burn down. And, and so you clear the land that way. And when, the, when all the brush is cleared away and all burned up, what is left? Well, whatever's there, right? Whatever might be there. You, know, you, you ever had a fire and you think it's all wood and, and stuff like that and you burn it and when it finished in all the ashes, you find a tin can or, or some other thing in there that you didn't even know was in the fire. Uh, that, that's what's, what's left. And so that's what Peter is saying. He said, look, when this great fire rolls through the universe of God's wrath and everything, all the wood and the hay and the stubble is burned up, you know what it's going to do? It's going to expose what's really there. It's going to expose what's really there. It's going to expose those things that you thought were hidden. It's going to expose those things that you thought were covered up. It's going to expose the deepest recesses of your heart and your soul and your mind. It's going to show what was there. I have another uh, illustration that, uh, again, is somewhat lighthearted and funny, but the, the point is not funny at all. But I, I feel like I have to tell it because it, make, it, it helps us understand what I believe Peter is talking about. Years ago, uh, and I'm talking 20-something years ago, at our old building, the old building before Hurricane Katrina, the one that was uh, built in 1952. Some, some of y'all will remember our old building. Uh, it was built in 1952. It was the building that was here when I first got here in 1994. Uh, it was about in the middle of where the par parking lot is. It was a small little building. If I remember right, it was about 24 feet wide and 60 feet long. It was just a little white uh, uh, siding, a uh, little uh, uh, church building uh, there. And it was built up a few feet off, a couple of feet off the ground on a chain wall, concrete block chain wall. There's a chain wall marked all the way around it, made out of concrete blocks. I think it sat about two or three feet tall. And then a couple of places in the middle, you know, there's, uh, there's concrete blocks and it was sitting on uh, six by sixes. And so that's the, the structure of the building. When I first got here, there was a lot of problems with the building. We needed to do a lot of repairs and we had to do, re, put new siding on it and uh, put a new steeple on. The steeple had blown, been blown off with Hurricane Kabil in 1969. We put a new steeple on. But one of the more difficult problems and, uh, was that we had a, basically an erosion problem or a sinking problem, one or the other, underneath the building in the middle of that chain wall. So there was a Brick, think about a concrete block, block chain wall about two or three feet, uh, two or three blocks tall, and the building sitting on top of it. And underneath the building had kind of sunk deep, sh deeper than the surrounding land. And so you can imagine what that does around here when it rains, or basically any time, because it's usually almost always wet. And the water would just sit underneath the building, uh, especially right at the front door. There was a, like, almost two foot a dip right under the front door was rotting out the wood underneath it. I remember for a while, uh, we, when we come in the front door, you kind of had to step over uh, a little bit because the, the floor was rotting out. You didn't want to fall through. Uh, some of y'all remember those days. And so we fixed the floor there, but without fixing the underlying problem, that was just gonna, it was just going to rot again. And so we were trying to figure out, what are we going to do? I mean, there was basically, at times, two or three inches of water sitting under the entire building, like a swimming pool under there. Uh, but you couldn't get under there except for in the back. There was one a little place where the bricks were missing as you could see in and see there's water in there. But what are you going to do? And so we, we finally figured, long story short, we finally figured the best way to do it would be pump concrete underneath it. 
And so he'd pump concrete and, and bring the ground up, and that way the water wouldn't get in. And so I, we started calling. I started calling contractors all around, trying to hire someone to come with a pump truck and pump concrete under there. Nobody wanted to do it. Uh, I mean, at any price, nobody wanted to crawl under the building and pump concrete under there. I, I told them, look, how much? Just give us a quote. They'd come and look at it like, no, we're not doing that. Uh, they, nobody would do it. And so, guess who ended up doing it? <laughs> the only person that's stupid enough to crawl under the building. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I put on, actually, I had a partner in crime, me and uh, Mr. Ed McClendon. Some of y'all remember uh, Brother Ed. Um, he's in heaven now. And so, uh, but me and Brother Ed put on plastic suits and had a pump truck, and we crawled underneath the building all the way to the front and started pumping concrete. And we had trowels and trying to, to smooth it out as much as we could. Remember, there's a crawl space only about two feet uh, crawl space under there. And we're sitting there with flashlights swimming around in wet concrete trying to smooth it out as much as we could. And we got it all under there. And Before I climbed out, I remember writing my name in the concrete. I mean, why wouldn't you? And so, uh, Chris, I wrote my name in the concrete, Elborn. I'm pretty sure it was 2001 because I remember writing Elborn 2001. And I remember thinking, that's going to be there till Jesus comes back. Well, little did I know that four years later, Hurricane Katrina would take that whole building away. And for several weeks, we had church right there on that rough piece of concrete. Some people called it a slab. <laughs> and uh, and was, people were, dudes was getting around the country that we were having church just on our slab. And when people would come, they start walking around that slab, Mark, and it was, I mean, the concrete was like this. I mean, you could imagine uh, trying to smooth concrete, finish concrete, lay it on your belly, swimming. And it was, the concrete was like this. And I remember many guys looking at it and saying, man, who poured this slab? <laughs> and, and then, and then, oh, Elborn right there. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and Brother Ed, uh, Brother Ed abandoned me and went to heaven. He couldn't back me up. And so, uh, so there I was holding the bag. Yep, I did it. Uh, that, that's it. And, and so I told you it was a kind of funny story, because, but the reality is that storm blew it away, and what was done was exposed for everybody to see. And as funny as that story is now, what Peter's talking about isn't funny at all. He said that fire is going to come, and one day it's going to expose everything. It's going to expose your life. It's going to expose every deed that you have ever done. It's going to expose every thought that you have ever thought. It's going to expose every motive of your heart. It will be laid bare for the judgment of God to pour down on your soul. But do you hear the gravity that Peter is painting for us here? Now what are we as Christians to do about this? Well, Peter goes on in verse 11 to explain some of the implications and application. And we'll be looking at that, Lord willing, next week or in coming weeks. But I want to, at this point, as we're in conclusion, to link over to a sister passage in Jude. If you want to turn to it, you can, but I'll just read it for you. In Jude, which is only one chapter in Jude, and I think I've mentioned this a couple of times before, Jude is very similar to 2 Peter. It's almost like, it's a lot shorter but Jude, it's almost like Jude and Peter are using the same outline, but you know, using a lot of different words and everything. They're kind of tracking along the same thing. And at this point where Peter is, is elaborating on this coming destruction for the ungodly, listen to what, and, and the, in the face of the doubters and the scoffers and the mockers, listen to what Jude says. I think this is very important. Listen to what Jude says in verse 22. I'll start with verse 22. He says, and have mercy. This is what you, we as Christians ought to be doing. And have mercy on those who doubt. So there are doubters, there are mockers, there are scoffers who say the judgment of God is not coming. What are we to do in light of that? He says, have, have compassion on them. Now, our, our natural tendency is to want to bow up and argue, right? And I have a lot of, a lot of pastor friends of mine that they say, hey, it's time to fight. And yes, there is a time to fight. But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty. And the way that we fight this battle is by showing mercy and compassion to those who just don't get it yet, whose eyes are still blinded to the truth, 
who ear, whose ears are still stopped up to the Gospel, whose hearts are dead to the things of the Lord. We are to have mercy and compassion upon them. And it plays out like this. Look at verse 23 in Jude. He says, And save others by snatching them out of the fire. That's the language that I wanted to pick up on. Snatching them out of the fire. Peter says there is a fire coming. There is a day of the Lord coming that is going to burn this universe with a mighty roar and melt the very elements of existence down to nothing. And the only thing that is left are those things that God's judgment will be poured out upon. And as we smell the smoke, what are we to be about? Snatching people out of the fire. That's what we're doing here. That's what we're doing here. That's what, it, that's what it's all about. Snatching people out of the fire. I mentioned my, my friend Randy McCarver just a moment ago. He told me a story. I think it was Randy. I don't want to misquote him. I might have picked this story up by, from someone else, but Randy's a fireman, and he's the one that tells the fireman stories. And, and, just, and so I think it was Randy that told me this story about going to a fire one day. And the house was engulfed in flames. And they'd gotten almost everybody out. And there's one person left in the house in a back room. The front of the house had already collapsed down. And so there was no way for them to get out or any firefighters to safely get in. And time was running out. The, the beams of the roof rafters were starting to crack. And so Randy went around the sod and, and used a chainsaw and cut a little hole in the side of the house and reached in and pulled the person out right before the house collapsed under the weight of the burning flames. That's the image that I have in my mind that Peter is talking about here and that Jude is talking about here. That our responsibility as believers are that we know that the, the, the fire is coming. We know the day of the Lord is coming. It is, it is our duty and responsibility to snatch them out of the fire. That is why we preach the gospel. That is why we herald the good news. That is why we meet together and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. That while there is judgment day coming, there is a way of escape. We need to be like evangelists in Pilgrim's Progress who is shouting the message of John the Baptist, flee from the wrath to come. Flee from the wrath to come. Flee from the wrath to come. We tell the good news. Well, first we start with the bad news that there is a judgment day coming. We start with the bad news that they are under condemnation from God. Even though they don't want to hear it and they want to close their ears to it and they mock and they scoff and they ridicule like Peter says as they will, we must proclaim the message that you are in trouble. We smell the smoke. We see the flames on the horizon. The Word of God is clear. There is a judgment day coming. You have broken God's laws. You have thumbed your nose at His commands. You have made up your own rules and your own regulations. And you think that God is turning a deaf ear and a blind eye to your actions. We can assure you, He is not. He is in heaven storing up for the day of wrath to be poured out upon your soul if you do not repent. The good news is, in light of the fact that God is holy and righteous and just and must punish sin, He is also loving and gracious and kind and forgiving. And that is why God Himself came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ on a grand rescue mission. And He lived a sinless life. He lived a perfect life. He never sinned. He has nothing, no marks against Him on His record. And when he died on the cross, he was taking this wrath of God on his head. He was drinking down the cup of God's wrath to the dregs for all who would repent of their sins and trust in him. Who would repent of their sins and trust in Christ. That is how we flee from the wrath to come. We have the wrath of God on one side and the cross of Christ on the other. We run from the wrath of God and run to the cross of Christ, bowing at His feet, thanking Him for the forgiveness that flows from His finished work. As He died on the cross and was buried on the third day, rose from the grave, proving that He is victorious over sin, death, 
hell and the grave, proving that His sacrifice was accepted by an almighty God in heaven. Oh, what a Savior we have to rescue us from this burning building that we call the planet Earth. Peter's words here are clear. The day of the Lord will come. Let us as believers snatch our brothers and sisters, our parents, our children, our neighbors, our co-workers, our family and friends, as many as we can from our community, snatch them out of the fire for God's glory. Dear Lord God, I do thank you for your word. We thank you for this reminder, the gravity that Peter reminds us of, of this coming day of the Lord. Whenever it may come, we know it will come. And between now and then, we pray that we would snatch souls of men and women, boys and girls, out of the fire. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things.